If you've been using Blender for a bit, you might still not know much about compositing. And if you know about compositing, you've probably been doing it outside of Blender. That is, because Blender's compositor had rightfully earned a reputation for being quite slow, limited, or just weird when compared to other compositing softwares such as Nuke, Fusion, or After Effects. But through the cycle of Blender 4 and culminating in 5.0, the compositor has seen a major overhaul, making it faster, more capable, and benefit more from the fact of it being integrated with a fully-fledged 3D application in ways that other compositing software just can't because they aren't. And with further plans to integrate the compositor into more areas of Blender, now is the time to start learning compositing. In this tutorial, you'll learn how the compositor works, how to use it at different stages of production, how to make your own tools, and what to expect if you're transitioning from other software. Plus, a glimpse into how the compositor will play a big part in Blender's future. Let's begin! By the way, hi, my name is Pau and I'm a lighting artist in the field of animation. Make sure to follow this channel if you want to learn more about how to use light and color to make your renders prettier. First, what is compositing and why is it so important? You can think of compositing as just a fancy way to edit images. Through compositing, you can do similar things as you can with Photoshop, GIMP or other image editing software, just with the main difference, you do it through nodes. Although it can feel weird at first, nodes allow us to reuse the same effects for different images of, or multiple frames of an animation or VFX shot, making it crucial if you're working in film. Now, before we jump right into Blender, I want to leave you with just one thought and that is that you should always, always comp your renders. 3D work, no matter how good the modeling, texturing or lighting, produces digitally perfect images that real cameras or even our eyes just don't. Through compositing, we can fix that. Let's see how. As of Blender 5.0, there are four main ways to work with the compositor. Simple post-processing, viewport compositing, sequence modifier and standalone. We'll begin by the most common and simple one. You've done some amazing scene, you've rendered it, now you want to give it some extra love with compositing. The way you do that is by switching to the compositing workspace. There you have a node editor and an asset browser, which we'll talk about in a second. You'll click on new and that'll do two things. Create a compositing node graph and drop your image as a backdrop. Now, before you start pulling your hair out, I'm not a fan of having the image behind the nodes either. We'll fix that in a second. But first, these nodes. The view layer node represents what's been rendered out of your render engine, say EV or Cycles. The group output is what's going to be rendered out as your file or appear in the render result window. Just like any other node editor in Blender, through Shift A you can add nodes that act as filters would in Photoshop or GIMP. If you want to blur your image, you can just add a blur node to the stream. Now Blender will first render your image, then blur it, and after that it'll show it on your render result window. With the viewer, you can preview your image at any point of the graph by Ctrl Shift clicking on any node we want to preview. You should remember though that even if you're viewing the unblurred image, as long as the group output is connected to the blur node, your render will appear blurred. And we'll move on from simple blurring in a second, but first I want to address the elephant in the room. The backdrop. It doesn't take a lot of compositing experience to realize that having your nodes on top of your image is not very comfortable. Furthermore, you need to V and Alt V to zoom in and out and Alt middle mouse to move it around, which is uncomfortable to say the least. And I don't like that as of 5.0 this is still the default way to work in Blender, but there's an easy alternative. You can disable the backdrop by clicking here at the top right and split the area. Set the new window to image viewer and the image to viewer node. Now, just like in the backdrop before, you'll see whatever is connected to the viewer. Aside from being arguably just better, the image editor allows for overlays which can display the image scene dimensions with a handy frame. This is very useful if you're going to be transforming your image, as you'll see which parts are going to be rendered out and which are going to be cut out. The last setup step I want to mention is the compositor device. By default, Blender will use the CPU to render the compositor. We can change this to the GPU on the Properties panel under Options Performance. You can also find this on the Render Settings under Performance Compositor. Using the GPU is massively faster than the CPU and as of 5.0 everything should look the same no matter what device you choose. And last, if you don't want to set this up for every time you want to do compositing, you can go into File Defaults and Save Startup File when doing this from a clean file. Another benefit of using the Image Editor is that now you can right click on any part 
of the image to inspect the color. For the nerds out there, you can see the color on HSB, float, and the display color. For the rest of you, you only need to know that unlike your typical images you edit with Photoshop, your renders store colors that are brighter than what your screen can display. For example, this flame appears roughly white on your display. But if we inspect the colors, we can see that it's very green and not so red or blue. It's just that the values are so bright that most common displays fail to represent that. A way we can use these higher values is by using the glare node, which is one of the common nodes I want to talk about. The glare node allows these highlights to spill their color into neighboring pixels through different effects. Out of all this, arguably the most important one is the bloom option, which resembles how our cameras or even our eyes perceive bright objects. I love how big of an impact that has. On to other important notes, the color balance node is your go-to node for simple color tweaks, such as changing the values of your image or shifting color. If you're coming from Nuke, this is your great node. For more advanced color grading, you can use the color correction node, with individual controls for shadows, midtones, and highlights, and simple control for your saturation and contrast. Nuke-wise, this is the equivalent of the color correct. You'll find that most of these effects are quite simple, but as a 5.0, Blender also comes with the shelf of node group assets. You can think of this as presets to do more complex operations, such as chromatic aberration or a vignette. These are, in fact, node groups, which means that they're complex nodes made out of more simple nodes which are hidden on the inside. They're designed to let you have all the artistic control without any of the technical burden. At the end of this tutorial, I'll explain how to make some of your own. A typical post-processing graph for me would at least contain a bit of bloom and vignette to make our image feel more natural and pleasing to the eye. And then I would add a color correct, maybe to add a bit of punchiness that the bloom sometimes reduces. For me, this is the bare minimum when it comes to compositing, and it really is the closest thing to a make it pretty button that I've ever seen. Just make sure not to abuse it, because it can easily look like you're stuck on 2013's Instagram real quick. It's important to note that the graph is read left to right, and the order in which you add your notes might affect the output. Say you want to make your image more red, but afterwards you decide to decide saturated. That's not the same as desaturating your image and then making it red. Something to keep in mind. Up until now, everything we've done is the Photoshop equivalent of just adding filters. But that's far from all the compositor can do. You may or may not know that this image output that showcases the lighting and shading of your scene isn't all that Cycles or EV can render. Under the View Layer tab of the Properties panel, there is a Passes dropdown with all the extra passes you can generate. These represent additional information from a render that can be used to finesse it in compositing. I go over what most of these mean in my NPR compositing tutorial series in my YouTube channel. You should check that out if you want to learn more. But to give you 5 cents, some easy to understand are the Ambient Occlusion and Cryptomat passes. When you click them, you see new sockets will appear on our View Layer node. These appear empty now because we haven't rendered them yet. I'll be render. And voila! You now have access to more information from your render. You can operate on this by mixing them with your combined pass by using a mix node set to color. You can think of this as blend modes in Photoshop, just that the layer you use to modify our image goes in the bottom socket instead of the top layer. For instance, say you want to add a bit more ambient occlusion to your render by setting the ambient occlusion to multiply. You do that by plugging the combined image at the top and then the ambient occlusion at the bottom and set the mix mode to multiply, or any other blend mode. And the factor then allows you to adjust the strength of the effect. You probably wouldn't want to do this in cycles because the ambient occlusion is already taken care of in the render, but in EV, since everything is a cheat, this might actually help realism. An alternative way to use the passes is to create masks. By inverting the ambient occlusion output, I can create a mask that now has white on the occluded areas and black on the rest. If you connect this to the factor, you are now using this mask to drive the strength of the effect. In this case, our effect is multiplying by, say, blue. You can think of the values of the mask as the strength of the effect now. The brighter the mask, the more blue you are multiplying to your image. Talking about masks, you'll find the new best friend in the Cryptomat node. As long as you have the Cryptomat passes enabled and you've rendered them out, you can drop a Cryptomat node at any point on the graph. Then you can preview your pick output and use the eyedropper to select any object in your scene. Now this node will generate a perfect mask of that object that you can use to drive the strength of any effect. For instance, you now can select both eyes and use them to drive the color balance node by plugging the mat into the factor socket. 
Now, if we make them bright enough, they'll glow through the glare node. Yay! You can think of these as Photoshop selections, just that they update automatically on every frame and that you can change them at any time. Say, if you now want to make the arms glow too, you can add them to the mask and there you have it. Working with notes might feel weird, but it is powerful. More ways you can use the compositor. Compositing in the viewport. This is where Blender really takes advantage of compositing and rendering in the same software. If you now want to go back and do some changes on your scene, instead of working on your dry render, you can have the compositor act on top of your viewport by going to the shading tab under viewport compositor and choose camera or always. The latter, unlike camera, will have the compositor act always on top of our images no matter where you're looking from. This way we can take into account the bloom and vignette while we're lighting, which is cool. One thing you'll immediately notice though is that if you're using cycles, all the edits you had done with your render passes, in our case the brightening of the eyes, aren't working. If you open a compositing window, you can see why. The edits are still there and they will work after the render, but render passes are not yet supported on the viewport when using cycles but they are in Eevee. And this is a big win for anybody doing stylized rendering, as you can add stylization filters on top of your entire image while you work on your scene. One of my favorite filters is the Kuwahara node, which makes your image look kind of painterly. Being able to preview this in real time is lots of fun, and I have these two hours of videos that I mentioned earlier just talking about different ways to make effects like this, which you should totally check out. But there's an issue with that that's not obvious at first. Say you're loving your painterly effect and you now want to render it in high resolution. You'll be disappointed to find that your image looks significantly different from what you saw in the preview, since the scale of the effect looks kind of off. Nothing we can't fix. The reason for the look difference is that the size parameter of the Kuahara node, much like lots of other parameters in the compositor, is measured in pixels. Now your final render might be HD, but your viewport resolution is just as big as the portion of the screen you're displaying it on. And 20 pixels on a small image appear much larger than the same 20 pixels in a high resolution one. The key to solving this issue is the new relative to pixel node. Plugging image to image and size to size, we now can set any pixel based parameter on our graph by writing the size relative to the image and then letting Blender calculate how many pixels that is. This way, if the resolution changes, our effect will look visually the same. Now, instead of 20 pixels, we can say that our size is 0.03, or what's the same, 3% the size of our image on, in this case, the x-axis. Now you can safely stylize away. And that's all very cool, but now say you want to render this animation using cycles. You do not want to render with compositing. Now say, God forbid, you've rendered your animation with compositing on top. Since you're using cycles, your images are taking minutes to render per frame. Now, if you add that up to the entire animation, you're looking at hours of rendering. Say, after all these hours, you now want to change the strength of the glow. You see where I'm going, right? You really can't do that. And you don't want to re-render all the cycles work just for some compositing fix. That's when you'll want to render dry and then do the compositing in a separate file, where we load these dry renders and do the compositing on its own. For that, we don't need to delete our node graph because we might still want this to preview these effects in the viewport, but in parallel, we're going to add a file output node. Whatever we connect to this will be rendered out in the path we describe. We generally want to write out multi-layer EXRs for this kind of work. Connect all the outputs and now Blender will render first and then save the EXRs to whatever directory we've specified and then it will still save the composite unless we tell it otherwise. Once your rendering is done, in a new file you can go straight to the compositor workspace, delete your render layers node, since we're not going to be rendering anything, and then add an image sequence. Now you can select your EXR files and you can compose it safely. Just make sure that your scene resolution, frame range and frames per second match those of your media. Now, since it's only the compositing we're dealing with, it'll render all your changes in no time. This is also very helpful to fix little mistakes in your renders. As long as you've rendered enough passes, you can change the colors of lights, objects and even materials in compositing. Since, again, compositing effects render really fast when compared to cycles, this is an amazing way to save yourself a lot of time if you need to do some little changes. It would take a bit of time to explain just how, but this video from CGBoost actually explained it quite well. 
I'll link it in the description. But still, let me know in the comments if you'd like to see me breaking down my compositing process in a more real and complicated scenario. Another way the compositor is creeping into new areas of Blender is through the sequence modifier. The video sequence editor is Blender's built-in video editor. Like objects in Blender, the video strips in your timeline can have modifiers that act like effects on top of your video. The basic ones are quite limited, but as of 5.0, a new compositor modifier can be introduced. Just add it and click new. Then you can open a new compositor and set it to sequencer mode. You can now use any of the effects of the compositor while still working on your video edit. Doing this, you can benefit from all the sequencer's features, like caching for instance, which is not yet supported when compositing as a post-processing effect. This workflow is great for simple mockups or if you're used to working in layers, such as in After Effects or Resolve to a certain extent. And to finish off, I want to talk a bit more about what's to come in the future of Blender, because Blender's plans include the compositor to be integrated into more areas of production. The NPR multi-stage compositing project aims to have the possibility to add compositing effects per object as part of the material. This will allow for stylized pixel-oriented effects to be part of an asset's look. This way, for example, if a stylized object is reflected on a mirror-like surface, the reflection will still have the stylization applied, which is a limitation of the current state of the compositor. I'll link this blog post in the description in case you want to learn more. And for all you nerds out there, before I wrap this video I want to finish up with a lightning round of 5 miscellaneous things you still might want to know. 1. Just like in the other note editors in Blender, you can use Ctrl 1, 2 or any other number to create viewers linked to that number. Now by pressing set numbers you will preview your image at different points of the graph, just like in Nuke. Two. Blender by default expects you to tweak the settings of each node on the nodes themselves, which some with experience in Nuke or Fusion might find a bit clunky. Using H toggles the expanded and collapsed state of the nodes, and Ctrl H hides and unhides unconnected sockets. You can still find and edit all the parameters by expanding the properties panel with N and going to the node tab, so you can kind of emulate the experience of compositing with that software. 3. Blender's compositor can now generate procedural textures. You can project them on the image by using the image coordinates node. This is very powerful because it also allows you to use any kind of data pass, such as the scene position, to drive these textures instead. 4. Blender does not have a Nuke equivalent of a Roto node for masking, since, as of now, we can't store data in the nodes themselves. You can, however, Create masks by changing your image viewer from view to mask, then clicking on new, and then add masks with shift A. You can now move them with G, R and S, like anywhere is in Blender, and Alt S scales the feather of the mask. Now you only need to call this mask in your composite through a mask node. And last but not least, 5. If there's a series of nodes you want to make reusable, you can group them with Ctrl G or right click make group. Now you can expose any of the parameters you want the user or you to edit later. You can rename the node and the parameters and set the faults in the properties panel under the group tab while being inside the node. You can navigate in and out of the nodes by using tap or double click. You can further organize your node graphs by selecting a few nodes and press F to add a backdrop and explain what they do. Now this is all I think you need to start playing around with compositing. I strongly recommend to just check out all the notes, see what's out there, see what it does, experiment, and make sure to check out my NPR compositing series if you want to learn more. And did I leave out something important? Just let everyone know in the comments. And that's it from me. Thank you so much for watching and see you all soon.